this is the very theme that we have behind the book of Acts that's been chosen for you guys to consider this year. That's the very theme behind it. It's an amazing book. It's a book, however, that is extremely challenging to both you and me tonight. And I'm sure it challenges our faith at times and it challenges our sincerity in our faith to our very core. And the book of Acts, as we'll see hopefully this evening, it causes us, and it will cause us, to question our dedication. It causes us to question our faith. And I'm sure these are things that you go through in your life, whether you're questioning your faith and your commitment. It causes us to question the way that we live every day, the choices that we make, where we go and what we do and how we work and how we act, how we serve. The book of Acts, it causes us to question our very life and the very way that we are choosing to live it and the direction that we're going. The book of Acts teaches us that life is not going to be easy. Life is not going to be easy. And if you do choose to serve a life in Christ, that your life is going to be difficult. The book of Acts teaches that, albeit with the prospect of a greater day to come. And lastly, what we hope to see tonight from the book of Acts is it causes us to question, what have we sacrificed for a life standing for Christ? It causes us to question, what have we given up for a life living with Christ. Now, perhaps you haven't thought of this, young people, up to this point, but the book of Acts is not a book that was written in the Bible many, many years ago and it's finished. It's not something that we can just pick up in our hand, read it, and think, well, that was the old days, it's all changed now. No. See, the book of Acts is a book which is continuing and continuing and continuing through each and every single one of us here in that room tonight. The book of Acts is a book which is continuing through generations. You know, the book of Acts, it commences in chapter 1 with a simple message, and it was in response to a question which was asked of the disciples to Christ. They said, when, uh, when they, the disciples, therefore come together, they asked of him, that's Christ, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And a simple question to which Christ provides a simple reply, but he replies not only to them, he replies to all of us that are here this evening. He says, he said unto them, and he says unto us here tonight, it is not for us to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. This is the key part for us this evening. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and this is a really key part for us tonight, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, we can't fall into the trap of thinking that these words that were written in the book of Acts was written years and years ago. These words are incredibly relevant and they're powerful words for us today. They're powerful words. Verse 8 particularly, you'll be witnesses, the key section for us, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, when we think of that, in reality... This has only been possible, really, for the last hundred or so years, hasn't it? With the way technology has advanced, it's in transport. The uttermost parts of the earth were, were really inaccessible, I suppose, for the Apostle Paul back in those days, as much as it would have been the then known world then. But now we really can preach that gospel message to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's been possible only recently. Hence the reason that I really want to... If I can impress upon you all that tonight, that the part that you guys play in continuing the book of Acts, the book which you have all chosen to come together tonight to learn about, it's living and it's constantly reaffirming its relevance through people as we go through in time. What a responsibility then on every single one of us here tonight. What a weight to carry. What a weight that you guys are going to have to carry. Because you're the future of our community. It's a massive responsibility. And I suppose this is the reason that I began tonight by describing the feelings that I had when I left last time. That comfort. And when you stand up here on the platform tonight and you look out at a hundred or so young people who have chosen to spend their night doing something which the majority of the world would have chosen not to do. 
it's extremely comforting. And it's the very fulfilment, it's the very fulfilment that the book of Acts is a book that is alive today and it's continuing it today. It's a fulfilment that the book of Acts is a living book. It's a breathing book. And it's a book which all of us here tonight can carry and be a part of. That all of us here tonight can preserve the faith, to present the gospel. And together, united as a young people and as a community, keep the fire burning. Well, our subject tonight is to look, as we said, at one of the characters in Acts, this man called Silas, continuing our theme of standing with Christ. The theme of standing with Christ is huge. It's massive. And I'm sure as you've gone through the year, you've seen how challenging it is. It's challenging for us all, no matter your age and, and, and position in life. And in Silas, we have a man who who really epitomised this theme of, of, of living the truth. He lived the truth. He stood by Christ and he lived it every single day of his life and it became essentially a part of his identity. Well, straight off the bat, what do we know about Silas? Well, let's take a look at the record and see where Silas is first mentioned. If you open up your Bibles, come to the book of Acts and chapter 15, verse 22, the, the chapter previous to our reading. And the background to this chapter in Acts 15 is this thing called the Jerusalem Conference. Now you may remember, if you know a little bit about the Jerusalem Conference, that it was a conference where the debate was had essentially between the Jews who were adamant that circumcision was essential in order to have a relationship with God and with his son. And we read really important words of James in verse 14 of Acts 15. He says, Simeon hath declared, and this is really key for us tonight, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take them out of people for his name. Because this is us. This is where we were born. And these words here is where we have the words for which we call our meetings, isn't it? This is where we get our word ecclesia or a group of called out ones. I'm not great at PowerPoint. This is where we get the name Ecclesia, called out once. We're the beneficiaries. We've benefited from this conference where an agreement was made that circumcision was not an essential requirement to a life in Christ. Where the Apostle Paul highlighted, having been sent to Jerusalem to assist in resolving and solving this issue, and he reinforced that the hope of the gospel was not one that was confined to just Jews. This wasn't just something that the Jews had a part of. This had something that was inclusive of every single person on the planet, whether you're, you're Jews, Greeks, French, Spanish, Italian, whatever nationality you are. All of us here tonight have a part in the gospel message. So they solved it at the Jerusalem conference, Paul and, and these apostles, um, including Silas. And as a follow-on from the conference, the, the, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem authorised and, and the leaders of the Jerusalem Ecclesia thought that it would be, it would be beneficial for a few of their members to travel back to a place in Antioch in Turkey to, or in order to spread the message that everything's resolved. And uh, they sent Paul and Barnabas with this message of inclusion back to Antioch and they chose to send some eyewitnesses from the Jerusalem meeting in Silas and Barnabas so that they could be a witness to the letter that Paul was sending on his way. So that's our first introduction to Silas. And the very first thing that we know of Silas is in verse 22, is that they were chosen men and that, they, that he was a chief man. Chosen men... And chief men. They were quality people, these, this, these two men. Silas was a quality brother in the ecclesia with a sound reputation. Silas, we see, was not a member of the Jerusalem meeting who was inexperienced. He wasn't a member of the Jerusalem meeting who was intermittent. He wasn't a member of the Jerusalem meeting who was sporadic in his attendance. And he wasn't a member of the Jerusalem meeting who was irrational in his judgment. Silas was a leader. And he was held in such high regard from his fellow brothers and sisters of the Jerusalem meeting that of all the candidates in that meeting, they chose Silas to travel with the Apostle Paul to Antioch or, or Turkey today. A non-Jewish 
area of the world in order to assist Paul in selling the Jerusalem Conference Agreement. Paul and Barnabas to travel to this region carrying letters of the agreement reached. And as we can see in verse 25 and 26, Silas's job was to be eyewitness of the agreement as a representative from the Jerusalem meeting. There is no doubt that one of Silas's key attributes was one of his, his real key attributes was the way that he could bring people together. Silas was a man who had great diplomacy skills. That he was a man who was able to pull people together, sell a message, and to then negotiate a good agreement, to assist in unifying people who at one point in time were at opposing ends of the spectrum and who had seemingly opposing ideals. Two groups who were far apart in their thinking were able to be brought together by Paul and with Silas's assistance also. But sitting here tonight, I don't think we really should take for granted, perhaps, the, the real significance of the Jerusalem Conference, young people. It may not mean so much for us here in 2022. But the spirit of the conference, the spirit of the conference is a spirit which we can learn many lessons from today. See, this, deb this divide, this debate or this difference of opinion, whatever you wanted to call it, between the two opposing groups had the very real possibility of dividing permanently the ecclesia world at the time. Very real possibility of splintering the ecclesia world, of creating different groups, of different identities, of creating perhaps different fellowships. The Jerusalem Conference had the very real possibility of dividing houses, of dividing families, of dividing friends, and separating and dividing ecclesias. And the wise brothers of the Jerusalem Ecclesia, together with the wisdom of the Apostle Paul, Barnabas and Silas, were able to discuss and they were able to debate with the intent for a suitable outcome without compromise. I want you to come with me to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, because Paul speaks to these words in the book of, book of Ephesians, particularly chapter 4. And he summarises it for us here. I think the spirit of this agreement, the importance and the lesson for us here tonight is the one of unity and one of working together. We'll read from verse 1 of Ephesians 4. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, because there is one body, there's one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now this is the same teaching that was agreed in the conference, to work together, to come to an agreement that the unity of the Spirit be preserved. Because as we know, we are one. However, however, unity for unity's sake was not the primary reason of the Apostle Paul, Barnabas, and no doubt Silas's mission, however. The main reason for their importance to the conference was the preservation of the truth. This was number one. This was the main reason. The non-compromising of scriptural principles and doctrinal purity. Unity had to come second in this case. See, for us living in 2022, the way that we as humans, and I'm sure we would all naturally do, and as society today would handle this situation, would be to have two parties come together and perhaps agree to disagree. And I'm sure it might have had the same effect, perhaps, that the Jerusalem guys would have walked away and done it their way and the Antioch crew would have walked away and done it their way, uh, perhaps not fighting, not getting too excited with each other, not angry, unified sort of in a way. But crucially, young people, they would have walked away being doctrinally compromised. And we need to know, young people, in our life and as we get older, that there are times that we are going to need to hold the line. 
There's going to be times that we need to hold the line and then there's times that we can compromise for unity's sake. The colour that we choose to paint our hall, compromise and probably go with unity, I would imagine. What time you want to start your meetings in your individual meeting, probably compromise and, and go with unity. You know, what you wanted to do on your camp program, go with unity. Supper menus, go with unity also and perhaps compromise. But we need to become really clear to know and understanding when to prioritise unity and know and understand when unity must come second to doctrinal purity. Because if we read on in verse 11, Paul reiterates a quote, which is not on my screen. This is why I just shouldn't do PowerPoint. He reiterates in verse 11. An ideal, he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be not children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head even Christ for the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So I suppose, young people, the very first lesson that we can learn from the life of Silas is one of an uncompromising desire to preserve the purity of the gospel. And as Christ delays, this will be a challenge that I will face, and I'm sure, no doubt, you will also that you will be faced with similar situations to those of the Jerusalem Conference, where you will face the struggle and the difficulty of weighing up, maintaining unity and the compromise of scriptural doctrine and integrity. The struggle of maintaining the unity of our community. But Silas has given us the right way to do it. He says he's shown us the way to do this through his work in the Jerusalem Conference. He kept the fire burning as we need to strive to do. He knew that to compromise on doctrine and right teaching was to fail in his mission as an apostle and a disciple of Christ. And he held the line. He held the line and he did not compromise. But, but he did it with love. And he did it with care for his brothers and sisters. So young people, when faced with the decision whether to prioritise unity over doctrinal purity, choose the Silas way. Remain uncompromising in doctrine and teaching in order that we keep the fire burning. That we learn when to hold the line, but we do it with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring always to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. One thing we learn about the character of Silas when we look at the record of his life in the book of Acts is his characteristic of dependability and reliability. And we see this in verse 33 you know, of Acts chapter 15. Verse 33, Silas, as we saw, he was sent to Antioch in Turkey in order to represent the ecclesia in Jerusalem, as we said, and and then we would assume that after he'd done this work and he'd, he'd been to Antioch, that he was going to return to Jerusalem. His work was done and he's finished and he can go back and relax back home. However, in verse 33 and 34, we read that when there was work to do in the ecclesia, when there was work to do in Silas's meeting, Silas was someone who was going to stick around. He wanted to help. Silas was someone that would dig in, get in the trenches and get the job done. Acts 15.32, And Judas and Silas, being prophets unto themselves, also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them 
And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles, notwithstanding, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still. Silas was all about digging in for the long haul. He was committed thoroughly to the cause to which he was called to. He was prepared to put the work in. And in an area of the world he was not familiar with, uh, familiar with he still stuck it out in order to further the mission that he had, that he was given to spread the gospel message. Perhaps we aren't as committed to the cause as Silas was. Perhaps we aren't as dependable as we would like to ideally be, ideally be either. Perhaps we would be more, want to be more like, more reliable, more dependable and more stable. Because these are characteristics that are essential in the life of someone who is standing for Christ. Dependability and reliability. Essential in our walk in Christ. Silas was the ultimate wingman. Not in the way that I'm sure you're all thinking, but he was the ultimate wingman in the true sense of the word. A wingman refers to the pattern in which fighter jets fly. There's always a lead aircraft and there's another aircraft that flies just to the side and behind the right wing of the lead fighter jet. I know that because I like planes. But it's true. The second pilot is called the wingman because the wingman's role is to protect the lead by watching his back. The wingman's role is to support combat of making the flight safer and more capable. The wingman's job is to amplify situational awareness to increase firepower and delivery and allowing more dynamic tactics to be carried out by that lead aircraft. An instructor pilot in the 457th Fighter Squadron, he was Major Jason Piper, when asked what qualities make a good wingman, he said this, a wingman does his homework, he asks questions, he listens, and he's always eager to learn. There's an unspoken bond between me and my wingman, and I know he's always got my back. And when we fly home, he's always going to be there. This was Silas. This was Silas. Silas was the ultimate wingman. We further see this further emphasised in the conclusion to chapter 15. Paul and Barnabas uh, asked, uh, Paul asked Barnabas to travel with him to some other areas of the world and to continue preaching the gospel. However, Barnabas wants to bring along a man called John Mark, who had actually left Paul in the past. He, he, Paul didn't have the confidence in him and they disagreed. You know, perhaps Paul knew that the work that he was going to be going to was going to be very intense, it was going to be difficult. And he needed, uh, he, he knew that it was going to be difficult and hard and he needed someone who was going to be able to face that. He knew it was going to be fast-paced, intense, and no distraction or hindrance would have been wanted by the Apostle Paul as he pursued the course that he was called to. Paul was driven. He was extremely driven and he needed someone that was going to be able to keep up with him. He had no time for the, for the delay because Paul was on a mission. There was work to be done. You either kept up with the Apostle Paul in his life or you dropped off and were fell, fell behind. And unfortunately, this disagreement between Paul and Barnabas and John Mark was, was so strong that it fractured their relationship so much that Barnabas left to travel with John Mark and Paul turned to someone else, and that was our man Silas. He turned to someone that he could depend on someone that he knew from his track record was reliable. In, a world today, in our world today, young people, it is crying out for people who are dependable. The ecclesial world today is crying out for young people who are dependable and reliable. So if there's one lesson that I could give you for as young people who are perhaps about to finish schooling, perhaps you're out to almost complete uni and enter the workforce and a life of employment. It is to be reliable and it is to be dependable and to be stable. Reliability and dependability mean that, when you, work, that, that you turn up to work on time. You're not late. And if you are late, you'll call in to somebody and let them know. Reliability means that if you make a commitment, you will live up to your commitment and you will honour it. Dependability means that when your boss is away, that you will continue to fulfil your duties without shirking your responsibilities. 
In a post-COVID world that is becoming increasingly more fragile and unstable, maintaining the examples of Silas in our lives will render ourselves useful in our day-to-day -day lives, including our employment or our school. But more than that, more than our employers, more than our employers, more so to our ecclesias. And as time goes on, we'll be faced with the increasing challenge that the Apostle Paul and Silas faced in encouraging our ecclesias and encouraging our friends to maintain the faith and to keep the fire burning. Your ecclesias, young people, are crying out for your stability, your reliability and your dependability. Your ecclesias are crying out for your commitment, they're crying out for your passion, your enthusiasm, your involvement, your ideas, your enthusiasm, your attendance. Be like Silas, who was all about digging in for the long haul. Be like Silas, who was committed thoroughly to the cause to which he was called to. Be like Silas, who was actually prepared to put the hard work in. Be like Silas, who was dependable, reliable and stable. And be like Silas to your mates in the truth. Be the ultimate wingman, as Silas was to the Apostle Paul. Be to your mates the support of making the way safer and more secure. To amplify your mates' awareness to danger. Be like Silas who had a bond with the Apostle Paul, an unspoken, an unspoken unbreakable bond between them that Paul trusted. Because Silas always had his back. And Silas was always there to bring the Apostle Paul home. Well, chapter 16 begins with Paul and Silas setting out on what became Paul's second missionary journey as we know it. And we'll skip the majority of the places that they travelled and we'll go right to chapter 16 and join the Apostle Paul and Silas from verse 12 in a place called Philippi. And they met a certain woman. Do yourselves a favour and look up in the Bible, a concordance or esort or whatever you use, the word certain. Certain men, certain women, amazing study in itself. It's a fantastic little, little look at and this certain woman is named, she's Lydia, seller of, of purple. And they met her down the river where people uh, gathered to pray. And she invites Paul and Silas to her house. And it seems that Lydia's house to Silas and Paul became the base for their work in this city. And we know the incident of the healing of the mentally ill young girl that Paul ended up healing. After many days of her crying out and, and, uh, and Paul and Silas seeing how upset and sad that she would have been in her condition and them feeling sympathy for her and the way that she was getting used by those evil men that were using her. They healed her of her, her illness. Now that was a massive game changer. All of a sudden, all of a sudden the peaceful existence that Silas and Paul began to know in, in Philippi was smashed to smithereens. And I would imagine that living at Lydia's house as guests would have been a pretty nice little existence I would have imagined they would have got looked after quite well perhaps in contrast to the dusty roads that they would have traveled would have been complete safety from the dangers of travel for the stresses of life of trying to make ends meet on on journeys and boats and, and traveling on roads it would have been a lovely place to come to a little oasis living with this lady Lydia and so far in their missionary journey, Paul and Silas's life had been going pretty good. They'd been converting people. People were coming to the knowledge of the gospel. The missionary journey so far had been a great success. The ecclesia in Philippi was flourishing. Lydia was caring for their needs. And then all in a flash, their lives were turned upside down and this all changed. In a moment, their life went from one of relative security to a life of immediate danger. And this in itself is a lesson for us young people, especially at the age that you guys are at. An age where everything is before you, you have your health, you have your friends, you have your family, you have your energy, and very quickly, in an instant, things can change very badly. When everything is going well and the bottom can fall out extremely quickly, our health perhaps can fail, our work dries up, our friends move on, whatever it may be. The book of Ecclesiastes warns us of exercising caution when things are going well. 
Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And I hate to break it to you, but a life in Christ is not going to be an easy life. It's something to which you and I need to give serious thought and serious consideration to. Because Silas is a classic example of this. He knew what he was signing up for. Silas knew what he was getting into on the journey. Of course he knew that he was going to be risking his life, danger. He knew that following the Apostle Paul on his journey was a life of sacrifice. And Silas knew that by leaving the comforts of Lydia's home and healing the disabled girl, that he most likely was also putting his life in danger. He was not naive. He knew what reaction healing this girl would get. And yet Silas chooses to do it anyway. In John 15, 17, it says, These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Words of Christ. The following questions may be slightly confronting to you, young people, because they confront me in all honesty as well. But it's worth us looking at ourselves deeply tonight and without judgment of each other. I ask myself the question tonight, young people, does the world hate me? And I'll ask the same of you, does the world hate you? You know, the world hated Christ. The world denies Christ currently. The world blasphemes Christ. The world has crucified Christ. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3 verse 13, he says that as servants of Christ, we should expect some level of discomfort of a life of standing and serving with Christ. 1 Peter 3.13, And who is he that will harm you? If ye be followers of them which is good, that which is good, but, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. A question that I often think about, and perhaps because life is so good in the country that we live, with what we have, the resources that we've been blessed with, and perhaps also the inclusive nature of society now where we are not able to vilify minorities and, and, it's, and accepting everyone for who they are or what they believe is a big part of the world's identity. And perhaps the lack of effort I put into in really making a stand for Christ at times or like, unlike the way that Paul and Silas did you know, I'm by far perfect in this, young people. I'm, I'm not here to uh, be a shining example. But I often ask myself the question, if a life of Christ is this easy, then maybe perhaps I'm not doing it right. I want us to think about that. If a life of Christ is this easy, then perhaps I'm not doing it right. Perhaps you've thought about the same. If your life for standing for Christ is easy, too easy, then perhaps we're doing it wrong. And another question I often find myself asking is, what have I given up in the last week for Christ? What have I gone without? Perhaps you've asked the same question. I want us to think of this tonight. If you can, you've got a pen and paper here ready. I challenge you to think of five things right now, right off the bat, that you have given up in the past week for Christ. Have a think and see if you can write down five things, just five, five things that you've given up for Christ. What did, what did we go without for Christ? Have we given up money? Probably not. Have we given up pleasures? Maybe not. Have we given up our careers? Probably not. Have we, given up, have we given up our families? Most likely no. Did we give up our Sunday night? 
maybe? Did we give up our Wednesday night? Or did we give God 30 seconds just before bed? Or did we give him a minute here on the way to work very quickly before we got in the car we forgot to in the morning? What have we given up in the past week for God, especially considering he gave up his son? Matthew 10, 37 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. For Silas, young people, he gave up everything in his service to Christ. Standing for Christ to Silas meant placing his life as second to the mission of spreading the gospel. So much so that we find Silas in Acts 16, verse 22, 24, in this situation, the multitude rising up together against them and the magistrates, they rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. I'd be filthy if this was me. Absolutely filthy, young people. I'd be filthy at myself for going with Paul on the journey. I'd be filthy for leaving Antioch to go. I'd be filthy for God for putting me in this situation where I was doing his work. I'd be filthy with the rulers of the city. I'd be filthy at the disabled girl. If she wasn't there, I wouldn't be in this situation either. I'd be filthy at Paul, the believers, Lydia, everybody. But not so Silas. Not so Silas. And the amazing thing, young people, is the fact that both Silas and Paul didn't use their literal get-out-of-jail-free card that they had in their pocket. They had one, and they chose not to use it. They were Romans. All they had to do was drop the Roman card and they would have been let go or at least given a fair trial. But they didn't. We read at the end of chapter 16 amazing courage and dedication to the cause of spreading the gospel from Silas. And you know, there was someone really, really special who was watching this beating. There was someone really important who was watching this beating and someone observing and supervising the beating as they went about their daily occupation. Because in verse 23, we're introduced to the jailer. This was a man who made sure that Paul and Silas were secured in the very most secure part of the prison, the inner prison, who personally oversaw that their feet were put soundly into stocks. He was a hardened man, no doubt. He would have been a tough guy. And he would have observed Paul and Silas as they were transferred roughly into prison, and he observed, and he watched. Young people, if there's one lesson that I want you to all remember tonight is this. Never underestimate who is watching you. Unbelievers are always watching. And how I act and how you act influences people in far more often than we realise. See, the jailer would have noticed the lack of excitement of the apostles, the lack of carry-on going on. See, the jailer would have noticed the lack of decorative language, the lack of physical retaliation and pushback. The jailer would have observed the willingness to comply. And I'm sure as he finished his day in the jail and he went home to his family, he would have been absolutely 100% thinking about these strange men that had entered his prison, these prisoners. Never, ever, ever underestimate in your life who is watching you. Never. What have I given up for Christ? What would we be prepared to give up for Christ? I've been able to give this some thought recently as I read a book which I would recommend all of you when you get some time to read as soon as you can. It's called Conscience in Action. You may have heard of it. It's this book here, Conscience in Action. In the introduction to this book, it begins with the words of, that we looked at earlier, 1 Peter chapter 3. And who, would he, and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. 
But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Containing these words of Peter is a warning that our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ might, as we've said, bring suffering and persecution. When challenged, we are exhorted to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. And we can only do this effectively if we have a good conscience before God. We can only do this effectively if we have a good conscience before God. And this book here, this book, Conscience in Action, is a record of brothers and sisters in Australia who had, over the years, demonstrated their good conscience when called upon to make a stand. Their experiences differed widely in this book. Some were treated very generously by the authorities, others were subject to ridicule and severe trial. All were required in varying ways to give an answer. And the, the introduction includes, uh, concluded with these words. In, in the introduction, it concludes with these words. It says, more importantly, we hope that it, this book will inspire the current generation of Christadelphians to consider their ways and to ensure that all aspects of their lives are in harmony with their faith to the end that all of us will be ready to give an answer to every man that asks in accordance with our good conscience. What have we given, young people, to Christ, to stand with Christ? I want to read about three brothers in this book tonight with you. The first was a brother from Germany in the Second World War, and his name was Uncle Albert Mertz. I want to read you a story about Uncle Albert Mertz. <coughs> the action of Albert Mertz, a Christadelphian under the Nazis in Germany who rejected military service, demonstrates the consistency of the Christadelphian stand across international borders. That Albert was not a cowardly shirker is demonstrated by the fact that he was prepared to die for his conscience. Though accused of being shirkers, his Australian Christelphian brothers were taking the same stand for the same reasons as Albert. He was jailed, I uh, can't really say this word, it's German, some detention prison in Berlin and subsequently sentenced to death. In trying to convince him that he should change his attitude, the defence counsel appointed to help him stated, you will remember that the rule of the jail read to you the word in the Bible literally where it said that everybody has to be subject to your authorities and the authorities are instituted by God. If you personally always say that the Bible is competent for you, then you must let this Bible word pass against your conception too. You were not able to answer this Bible word with a single word besides. If an authority, as our Führer here, calls upon the German nation to defend itself, if necessary with the sword, in the fight against int intended assaults of envious neighbours, and if he, as authority, introduced universal compulsory military service, this means, according to the before-mentioned Bible word, to, in, uh, an order approved by God, which every subject has to obey, and it is the firm conviction of me and every German man that our good Lord will be more pleased with a man who gave his life in doing his duty towards his country than with someone who wastes his life worthlessly only because he cannot change his mind from mere conceitedness this way of acting can never find the approval of our Lord. Albert was not waiting, wasting his life. He was obeying God. His belief was in the kingdom of God. He had no country. He was a pilgrim, a sojourner in Germany. And how could he have fought against his brother Christophians if such were in the British or Australian armies? They would not have been his enemy. In any event, he was told by Jesus that he should love his enemies. All Christadelphians have the same view, no matter where they are travelling. On February 23rd, uh, 23rd of February 1941, Uncle Albert wrote to his family, My beloved all, I'm going to struggle with this, sorry. I find it hard to write to you today, not for my own sake, but rather as I know that this letter will bring you much grief. Therefore, I want to ask you not to take it too hard. You know my faith and my hope. Christ is my life and to die is my profit. And do not cry on account of me, even if I have to suffer the worst. Be firm and compose yourself. 
if I was sentenced to death on the 21st of February and if I shall be decapitated, then you shall know that life that has taken shape in me goes back to its source and reshapes in time. When my time has ended and I have to part, I want you to remember that man is destined to die and afterwards to undergo judgment. Tomorrow I shall file a petition for pardon. Perhaps the court will have mercy on me, and if it has not, I still hope to get permission to write to you once again. Include me in your prayers. I want to come to a close now, trusting God and his kingdom, and I send you all my love. Uncle Albert was executed on Friday the 4th of April 1941. He demonstrated his conscience in action. The second brother I want to speak about is a brother from Adelaide. Some of you, have, you most likely will know the name, Uncle Ted Smith. Ted was already in the army in 1942. He did three months training and then had three months leave. During his three months, he became baptised and he applied to be registered as a conscientious objector. He went up before the court and was given non-combatant duties. He appealed and went up before the court again. The appeal was dismissed. He was called up again after some months. The sergeant delivered the order to report to the drill hall. Uncle Ted was given a rough time because he was a private and he refused to put on his uniform. He was threatened with being surrounded by bayonets. The threat was not followed through. He was then threatened with a court-martial. This was carried out immediately. He pleaded guilty to refusing to put on the uniform. He explained his change of allegiance. He was taken away and locked up in jail, and he was later told to go home as his application for exemption had been received. This was again refused, and he was taken back to the army. They told him he was to go to the Adelaide jail and was transported there. He was told again to put on the uniform. Uncle Ted refused and was slapped in the face. He was told that the blankets he was given for his use in his cell should be left outside his cell. This was later changed. He was then taken to the Gladstone jail, and he had to go on parade. He was told it was a military prison and they had to do what they were told. They marched around for three hours in the morning and then did the same in the afternoon. Uncle Ted's feet were badly blistered by, his, by this procedure. He prayed hard and a way was found out of the situation because of the assurance that God would not try him more than he was able to bear. A medical officer attended a day later and the officer told the army that Uncle Ted should be placed on light duties until his feet were healed. He was transferred to the kitchen. He was not allowed to eat sweets that were brought to him. He received considerable mail from brothers and sisters. Eventually he was given a leave pass. He went to Adelaide and to the meeting. He eventually received more leave passes which became longer. And finally he was able to be discharged some two years after he had called up. He returned a cheque he received for payment of his services back to the army. The third brother I want to talk about is super relevant to our talk this evening as we remember Paul and Silas in prison. I want you to think of Paul and Silas approaching midnight in pain from the stocks, the beatings, sitting on a cold, hard ground. The floor would have been reeking of stale urine, blood, vomit. And the man I want to talk about tonight is a Brisbane brother, Uncle Wally Crew. Wally was also put in Palin Creek Prison Farm in 1942. After spending some time there, he recalled that he was taken from the prison farm and sent back to Boggo Road Jail to wait for the appeal to be heard in the Supreme Court. I was back in Boggo Road for about one month before the appeal date came up, and here it was that prison methods and ways of living were, lit were bitterly learnt. I found out that brother Eric Boone had been sent back to Boggo Road 2 from Palin Creek Farm, having seen him in the jail yard. But I did not know which part of the jail that he was in. So climbing onto my hammock, getting as near to the grill on the high wall as I could, I sang the first verse of a hymn we both knew. Happy are they, and only they, who from thy precepts never stray. If Eric was near enough to hear me, he would sing the next verse. Who know the right, nor only so, but always practice what they know. And so we encouraged each other cell to cell. How beautiful is that, young people? 
But what does it mean for us sitting here tonight in cushy old Adelaide? Persecution free. We're rich. We're comfortable. We're supported by friends and family. What does it mean for us? Because one day we too are going to face the judge. Give an account of our life. How consistent are our stories going to be? How would we go under the similar scrutiny that these brothers faced? How would we go with our search history as examined against our professed beliefs? When our Instagram likes are scrutinised, our TikTok, our gaming, our purchasing inspected. When we compare our time online, how that compares to our time with God. What have we chosen to give up to have a life of standing with Christ? Verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, prayed and sang praises unto God, just like our Uncle Wally crew. They sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. The prisoner heard them, crucially put in the record for us. Of course the prisoners heard them. This, this, was, this was nuts. This was crazy. Prisoners calling out and praising God after they'd been beaten and put in stocks. This was totally bizarre. Of course the prisoners heard them. Well, we know the rest of the story, don't we? An earthquake, the prisoners' chains were loosed, the doors opened, and, and the fascinating thing for me is that absolutely none of the prisoners escaped when they had the opportunity to. That in the space of perhaps no more than 12 hours, Saul and Silas and Paul had had such an impact on the prison on a prison full of hardened criminals that none of them chose to flee the prison when they were more than able. What does that tell us? That the influence, the respect, the admiration which would have begun, firstly, in no doubt, laughter at the prisoners, ridicule and condemnation was so great, and the respect that these prisoners had for the Apostle Paul and Silas was so great that they all stuck around and they didn't flee. The influence that Silas and Paul had on the jailer from the beginning of their beatings as their consistent reaction through was an, uh, enough for his conversion and that of his old whole household. What an example of Silas. What a conviction. What a conscience in action. Acts 16 verse 40 we read, And they went out of the prison, having been released, and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Take a look at, Saul, take a look at Silas and Paul, young people. This, this is the men that they were. Remember, read verse 40 carefully. After all that Silas and Paul had been through, stocks, beatings, prison, and when they had seen the brethren, Silas and Paul comforted them. It wasn't the other way around. Silas was a man who cared not for his own well-being but that of his brothers and sisters. Silas's well-being came secondary to the spread of the gospel and his mission of keeping the fire burning. Well, we have to bring things to a close tonight. There's, there's a lot more that we could speak about this man, Silas, and perhaps if you find some time, continue this yourself. Silas, for me, young people, was the ultimate negotiator of peace and unity. However, he was first and foremost a brother who, when faced with the decision whether to prioritise unity over doctrinal purity, he chose the Silas way. He remained uncompromising in doctrine and teaching, and he endured that he kept the fire burning. In Silas, we have a man who was dependable and he was reliable. He was the ultimate wingman, as we said. And in a world that is becoming more increasingly unstable, it is crying out for stable people. It's crying out for stable people, dependable people. Dependable workers, students, employees, and in an ecclesial world which it is prophesied, as we know, that it's going to face increasing challenges the closer that we get to the return of Christ, is craving also stability. Your reliability, your dependability, your ecclesias are crying out for your commitment, your passion, your attendance, your involvement. And we also saw tonight that when things are going well, very quickly things can turn and change very, very quickly. That a life in service to Christ is not an easy life. And we've been able to ponder the question, if a life of Christ is this easy, then perhaps we're not doing it right. 
And we've also questioned, what have we given up for a life to be standing with Christ? Do we sacrifice like Uncle Albert Mertz, Uncle Ted Smith, or Uncle Wally Crew, or Uncle Silas? The crucial lesson for us to leave tonight with young people is, as, as we remember this man Silas, is that when standing up for God, never, ever, ever underestimate who is watching you. Just, the, just like the silent, observant jailer when Silas and Paul were beaten, unbelievers are always watching you and I, and they're watching us how we act. And how you and I act influences people far more than we will ever realise. So go forward in your ecclesia. Go forward in your work. Go forward at your school or at your uni. Go forward with your families. Go forward with your mates and your friends here tonight. And go forward with the spirit of Silas. Because Silas was a man who stood for Christ. And he was a man that always kept his fire burning. Thank you.